Hello everybody, my name is Mabel Gonzalez. I'm a chemistry student of Bogota, Colombia from the Universidad de los Andes. I have to blend both biology and chemistry in order to study the chemical ecology of one of the most coolest animals in nature, which are poison frogs. So I was very fortunate because I was born in Colombia, one of the most biodiverse countries in the world. So let's take a, to take, let's take a look to the numbers. We are the number one in biodiversity of orchids and birds. And we are the number two in biodiversity of amphibians, plants, and other organisms. Many of the areas of Colombia are covered of thick and space jungle, as you can see in this picture taken from the airplane when it was arriving to Quibdó, the capital city of Chocó, one of the most important states in Colombia in terms of biodiversity. So the Dendrobatidae family, which is the family of poison frogs that I was working on, they are only distributed in the neotropics from Central and South America. And they are accumulating these toxic compounds in the skin. So the skin is actually the sample that we are collecting in the jungle and analyzing using GCMS. Uh, this family of frogs are very famous for the different colors that they have, which are called aposematism, and they advertise the predators of the toxicity with this specific colorful coloration. Uh, the first pair of people that uh, discovered the toxin compounds in the frogs are, were the Embera, Embera Indians from Colombia, which actually were using the poison of the frog for envenomation of the darts, and then with blow guns, they were hunting uh, monkeys or other prey just for consumption. Right now, the indigenous people are not using the poison frogs anymore, but they actually have, still know how to uh, build and construct the blow guns and the darts, as you can see in this picture of a uh, current Embera indigenous, uh, in Indian, Indian person. So thanks to John Daly, who did the frog alkaloid program at NIH in 1963, trying to figure out which are the structure of the of the Indians were actually using in the darts, now we know more than 800 different alkaloids from different amphibians in the world. And so you need is the chemistry discovering the back of these frogs that we have a specific families for these specific compounds. And they are only found in frogs and the arthropods that they are eating, because that's another surprise. These frogs are not producing or synthesizing these chemical compounds, they are actually sequestering from the diet. So that's another thing that we are still, still trying to understand because we know that they eat it, accumulate it, and transport it to a specific glands in the skin, but we actually don't know how this is happening in the frogs, which is really interesting. Uh, some of the families that we can find in the, in the, in the, in the skin of the frogs are pumilotoxin, histronicotoxin, jephirotoxins, batracotoxins, and these are pretty unique of only these two sources, frogs and the arthropods that they are actually eating. What do we know is that in the back of these frogs, there are a great power for drug discovery. As it happens with epibatidine, one of the alkaloids that were isolated many years ago, and it has 200 fold more power uh, than morphine for being an, a good analgesic. Uh, so the nature, as you can see, provides endless inspiration for us to discover new biologically active compounds that may, for example, become new drugs. And this is one of the motivations for studying these specific animals. So now I'm interested in studying the inter-individual inter variation of the chemical profiles of the frogs, because when they were discovered and the first structures were uh, proposed, uh, the differences between specimens were hidden and I'm interested in knowing how big are the differences between different individuals and how it, this is related with different ecological variables that I have in my metadata. So for completing this task, I've been able to annotate known uh, and unknown compounds. There are several analytical challenges that I have to overcome. One of them is the unique chemistry of the frogs because this is very interesting, but it's also a problem because I lack of uh, standards that we're gonna be helping me to make a full annotation, a level one annotation. So another problem that they have is the reference data because it's very sparse and it was built in 2005. So for example, for this specific GC data, I don't have uh, retention indexes 
uh, that were helping me to uh, annotate the compounds. And um, uh, the last problem that I have is that the amount of, of sample that I have, because many of these alkaloids are in trace levels. So they are really difficult even to detect in some of the equipments. That's the reason why it's better to use mass spec instead of NMR for uh, targeting this specific uh, unique chemistry of the frogs. But now we have molecular networking for GCMS data, which can help us exploring the chemistry. And I'm going to show you an example of how these networks can be useful in a situation like we have, where we have limited reference information for the compounds that we care about. So now I have submitted my first job in the GCMS, in the GMTS GCMS platform. Now I can generate a network of the chemistry that have been detected by GCMS on the skin of these frogs. In this network, the color scale is showing the cosine score. So red means a poor match and green means a good match. And the cosine score is a value related to the reliability of the notation when my experimental fragmentation patterns were compared against the libraries that we have. In this case, the comparison were performed against Wiley and NIST. So when I take a look closer to one of the cluster of one specific compound that I'm really inter interested on is the pomidotoxin 251D. This is the or not the only one, but one of the few demonstrated cases of a metabolic side compound body frogs where they were hydroxylated to a more toxic version known as allopumilotoxin 267A. So, uh, as you can see, the node for this pomilotoxin is green, which means that the, re the annotation is pretty much reliable. But when I take a look to the uh, cluster, uh, I can see that this pumilotoxin is connected to a totally different compound, as you can see here, which is an ester. And after some years of experience analyzing the typical compounds found in the in derivative frogs, we are pretty sure that this annotation of a highly carboxylated ester, as you can see for the many hydroxyls, is probably wrong. Even if I look through the other possible matches in GMPS, uh, I, I can see that none of them make any sense. In the network, the spectra are closer based on the similarity of the spectra. So even if the compound is identified incorrectly, I will be networked with the relative compounds that have similar fragmentation patterns. So we're expecting that the, these two specific compounds, the pumulotoxin and the other one, have similar fragmentation patterns. Therefore, using the pneumolotoxin, which is a reliable annotation and could be my starting point, I can explore the annotation of this compound that I presume to be incorrectly annotated. So first, the first thing that I'm going to do is overlap the experimental mass spectrum and the library query for this compound. As you can see, the overlapping is not such good. The overlapping is just using the fragment of 166 for doing the, the match with this specific ester. Now, when we compare the mass spectra of the pumidotoxin 251D and this unknown node, we can see that there are many fragments shared between the two um, compounds. For example, is the 250, the 208, which is the loss of a three carbon of the side chain, and there are also uh, fragments, even the 166, that in this case is the bigger fragment. For the pumulotoxin, these fragments can be attributed to different structural fragments that you can see in this picture. For the other compound, we see that the fragment 70 is absent which is probably means that the compound could be an isomer of pumulotoxin 251D, but lacking the pyrrolidin moiety, that it was the one related with the 70 fragment. Therefore, we need to take a look at the amphibian family alkaloids. And we see that there is a related family to pumulotoxins called homopumulotoxins, 
and the only difference is that this family of alkaloids are compounds of two members of six rings instead of five and six, ring, six members as it happens in pomelotoxins. Additionally, there is another uh, family of alkaloids when you see a demethylation in the carbon 9 in the alkaloid. And this family is known as 9 desmethyl homopomeotoxins. Having this in mind, now instead of the most likely incorrect annotation that it was proposed initially uh, as an ester, we are proposing a new putative annotation of an alkaloid. This alkaloid appears to be new, not previously reported in Daly's library, and is found in trace amount in some of the species that we are analyzing in the network. We have called it 9 desmethyl homopodimolotoxin 251EE. Why EE? Because we are following the structure that was built by Daly for assigning the code names in the library that we, he were building in 205, 2005. Social annotation propagation analysis is now possible using molecular networking, as you can see with this specific example, using the unique chemistry of the poison frogs. So now we are very excited to continue using GMPS, GCMS platform for annotating the compounds and proposing putative annotations for possibly new compounds. The chemistry of these frogs is very rich and most likely many new compounds are still waiting for being discovered. This actually is not surprising as one of the studies has been proven in Argentinian toads where we, when they were comparing single skins they were also able to find new compounds. So we are expecting to find any more. Now thanks to GMPS we are going to be able also to share all these files and talk to other researchers we are working in the same area, trying to uh, find parameters for performing the annotations and being able to discover more compounds of the unique chemistry that frogs and toads all over the world are producing in the skin.